Welcome to today's presentation on the properties of STARS. We're going to take a general overview of STARS, not really talk about um, <clears throat> why they're the way they are, but rather classify them according to their properties. This is going to be very important for later on when we talk about the evolution of STARS, how they are born, how they uh, evolve, and uh, ultimately how they die. So again, this is really... Um, Something that, that scientists will often do is classify systems before they really understand them and then use the classifications to recognize different patterns. So again, uh, with the properties of stars, we're going to look at things like luminosity, really how bright they are, and uh, use a magnitude scale, just like we did with objects in the nighttime sky. We're going to talk about how we calculate distance to stars, the uh, spectral classifications. Um, this is very important because looking at the spectra from stars, most people think that, you know, astronomy, you're just looking through a telescope and you're taking pretty pictures or you're observing different things. It's really the uh, spectra that gives us much more information than um, many of the photographs that we've, we've taken. And certainly taking the spectra of stars early on helped us uh, determine many of the properties that we now know and recognize many of the patterns that we now have. We'll talk about classifying according to luminosity or how bright they are. And one of the most important uh, tools in studying stars uh, in terms of the analysis of stars is the HR diagram. The HR diagram plots uh, luminosity and temperature. And from this, many of the patterns that I was talking about uh, were recognized. We'll talk about binary and multiple stars, and then finally talk about the different masses of stars. So let's start with the brightness of stars. We already know with the magnitude scale that in the nighttime sky, if you're looking at different objects up there, the lower the magnitude, the brighter the object is. <clears throat> For instance, the brightest star in the sky, other than the sun, is Sirius. And that has a magnitude of about negative 1.5. 4, negative 1.5. Um, less bright stars, you know, at zero magnitude, Canopus is pretty close to that, uh, first magnitude, second magnitude, they're about as far as you can really see, you know, from Jersey City or from the, the, the New York metropolitan area. You know, uh, light pollution becomes a problem for anything um, that's dimmer than magnitude 1 or magnitude 2. And even in the darkest skies, the, the best that you can really hope for in order to see is magnitude 5 or 6. So the magnitude scale starts from brighter being a lower number, and in some cases even a negative number, and dimmer being a higher number. In fact, when we look at this, for every five magnitudes of difference, there's about 100 times difference in brightness. And for every magnitude difference, uh, there's about 2.5 times difference. So... Five magnitudes is 100 times, one magnitude is about 2.5 times. Now, we're not interested in the apparent magnitude. That's what we talked about with the, the nighttime sky before. Because the apparent magnitude is pretty much about uh, location and um, how bright it is intrinsically. We're interested in the intrinsic brightness only factoring out, you know, distance so that we can put everything on an equal weight. Like Sirius, for instance. Why is Sirius one of the brightest stars in the sky, or the brightest star in the nighttime sky? Well, yeah, it's a, you know brighter than the average star. It's brighter than our own sun. I think it's about four times brighter than our sun. Um, but it's close by. I mean, it's a, you know, about an average star, I'd have to say, a little above average. But it's so incredibly bright because it's in our own stellar neighborhood. In fact, some of the most intrinsically bright stars that we know of um, aren't even visible to our eye because they're so far away. So um, apparent magnitude, you know, that's basically talking about um, nighttime sky. How bright is it in our nighttime sky? Absolute magnitude or absolute visual magnitude is a better way of measuring stars are comparing stars, I should say. It's how bright the star would appear if it were 32.6 light years away, or to use a distance 
which is um, more popular for uh, you know measuring distances. Um, how bright would it appear if it were 10 parsecs from Earth? And a parsec, as you can see, if you do the math there, about 3.26 uh, light years. So, looking at the sky, the brightest stars in the sky. Well, you know, obviously, you know, starting with the brightest apparent magnitude, uh, we have the sun at negative 26.8 on the magnitude scale. I mean, it's so incredibly bright that um, it pretty much lights up the sky, and we can't really see very much when the sun is out. But again, um, talking about other bright stars in the sky, we have Sirius, uh, Canopus. I said zero. It's about negative one-half. Um, Arcturus. Arcturus is a good example of approximately a zero-magnitude sky because we can actually see that in the northern hemisphere. We can't see Canopus or uh, Alpha Centauri. Um, Vega is another good zero magnitude star, uh, approximately. So all these basic stars, all these bright stars, the brightest stars in the sky, um, are bright because they're, they're close by. However, if we look at their absolute magnitude, how bright would they really be if they're 10 parsecs away, if they were, you know, 32 light years from Earth? Well, you know, at that distance, in fact, we would barely even be able to see uh, our own sun. At a magnitude of 4.8, you'd need a really dark sky to see our sun. So our sun, um, as stars go, it's pretty average. But um, really, you know, it's not, you, you wouldn't be able to see it from a very large distance. Again, Sirius is brighter than our sun. Our sun is magnitude 4.83. Um, Sirius is magnitude 1.45. But again, if we were 10 parsecs away, probably wouldn't be all that impressive of a star. Canopus is a giant star, exceptionally bright. You can't see it in the, the northern uh, hemisphere um, unless you're at a really low latitude. But uh, Canopus in our own sky is the second brightest star uh, in the nighttime sky after Sirius. Its magnitude is negative 5.53, okay? It would be almost as bright as a first quarter moon if it were only 10 parsecs away. It's much more distant than that. And you can see some of these other Arcturus is a brighter than average star. Alpha Centauri is almost identical to our own sun. It's actually it's composed of three stars, um, Proxima Centauri being the, the distant companion, but there's an Alpha Centauri A and B. So on the absolute magnitude scale, it's a little bit brighter than our sun. Capella is another giant. Rigel is a supergiant. We'll talk a lot about Rigel. Procyon is a subgiant. And again, all these negative numbers are associated with stars that are really much bigger than our own sun. So again, um, when we're comparing these different stars, we can talk about, you know, how bright are they in our nighttime sky? You know, that doesn't give us the information we want when we're comparing and contrasting the properties of stars. It's the absolute magnitude that's really important because that tells us basically how bright things are, okay, at an equal distance. And again, here's uh, apparent magnitude of different objects, the sun, uh, the full moon. Venus is the brightest planet in the sky, and then you see all the other objects. Uh, on the darkest night, you can see down to magnitude 6. Um, you know, a very big research telescope can see down to the 19th magnitude. Um, Hubble Space Telescope can get out to the 30 magnitude. Now, when we're comparing apparent magnitude, how bright it is in the sky, and absolute magnitude, how bright it actually is, we can use something called the distance moduli. Now, the distance moduli is the difference between apparent and absolute. Okay? The greater that this number, okay, the more different the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude, the further away the star is. Okay? So if the two magnitudes are the same, 
then the star is 10 parsecs away because by definition, the absolute magnitude represents how bright that star would be at 10 parsecs. Okay? If there's a difference of one, then the star is 16 magnitudes away. Difference of two, 25 parsecs away. Okay? All the way up to 100 parsecs away for five orders of magnitude difference. Remember, the magnitude scale says for every five magnitudes, there's a factor of 100 difference. Okay, so distance is two stars. Great. Um, we know how bright a star appears in the sky and how bright it actually is, okay, is also related to the distance. So um, we can measure the brightness in the sky. Um, we need the distance, however, to determine absolute magnitude. And this is where it becomes really tricky. You look up into the heavens, and it's impossible to judge distances. Okay? Now, humans have binocular vision. We can actually judge distances pretty well, probably up to um, 10 or 20 feet. All right? You know, beyond 20 feet, we have some, dist some, some uh, problems with that. Because our brain actually compares the image in your left eye to the image in your right eye. Um, for stars, they're so incredibly distant. I mean, um, you're talking about light taking years to travel that distance that uh, um, we can't use our binocular vision for that. However, we can use something similar called parallax. Now, let's look at the distance to different objects. Um, we're going to compare how far away they are in kilometers, how far away they are in astronomical units. The astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and earth on average. How far they are um, in terms of light, how long light would it take to travel that. And finally, parsecs. Okay. Moon's right next door. I mean, the moon, you know, when you look at this, um, although... You know, it's quite a few kilometers. It's about a third of a million kilometers. Uh, light only takes 1.28 seconds to travel there. In terms of parsecs, um, it's a few millionths of a parsec away. So, you know, right in our backyard, closest celestial object to us. Sun a little bit longer. It takes about eight minutes for light to travel to. Still, in terms of parsecs, I'm sorry, I meant to say a few billionths for the moon in, in parsecs. For the sun, it's a few millionths of a parsec away. Really, really close. Now, compare that to the closest star. Proxima Centauri is 4.22 light years. It's a little over a parsec, or about a uh, one and a third parsecs from the Earth. The Pleiades, very close cluster of young stars. 450 light years. Okay? About 138 parsecs. The closest galaxies to us. The large Magellanic and small Magellanic clouds, 13,000 light years. The um, closest major or giant uh, galaxy is the Great Andromeda uh, galaxy, and that's two and a half million light years away. So what we see here is um, nearby stars are anywhere from about Five light years, I know Proxima Centauri is a little bit less than that, and so is Alpha Centauri, but about you know five light years to a couple hundred light years away. Okay? More distant stars within our own galaxy are um, you know, thousands of, of light years away. Our galaxy itself, it's kind of interesting that our galaxy itself um, you know, is close to 100,000 light years across but we're actually closer to these small dwarf galaxies um, than we are to the furthest reaches of our own galaxy. So, how do we measure these large distances? Um, most local stars are more than a million times farther than the planets. And in fact, our own galaxy, again, is over 100,000 light years across. To do this, if the stars are close enough, we can use a... Uh, process called parallax. And again, it works much like our vision does. Remember, we can judge distances for very close objects because we can actually uh, use 
the two images of each eye, the left and right eye, uh, provided that there's no impairment to the vision, to um, you know, see if something is close. Hold your finger out, if you will, in front of your face and blink your eyes back and forth. Open your right eye, then your left eye, then your right eye, and you'll see the image of your finger shift. The closer that the object is, the more different the images of the objects are. Well, we do the same thing with stars. As the Earth goes around the sun, it moves two astronomical units. Now, in stellar distances, that's not a whole lot. But it's enough to actually shift the position of very nearby stars. So when we're on this side of our solar system, a nearby star shown in red here might be over here. We take a photograph. Six months later, our Earth moves over here, and that star shifts. This shift um, from one side of the image to the other is larger if the star is closer to us. So we actually use a trick um, from our own you know, vision to measure distances. Now, the problem was um, these parallax me uh, measurements were very difficult to do um, with ground-based telescopes uh, due to atmospheric disturbance that would mo move the image. Um, now we're going to see that we actually have much more accurate tools to take these measurements. Before we go to um, talking about you know, the different devices that we have to make these measurements, we should explain a few things and tell you where the units of parsecs came from. So let's start with the sky. Basically, a circle has 360 degrees, okay? Um, only 180 degrees can be viewed at any one time if we're talking about the, the nighttime sky, okay? Um, so if you look from one horizon, go all the way to the other horizon, that's 180 degrees. We can divide each degree further into smaller units called arc minutes, okay, or minutes of arc. One degree is divided into 60 smaller units. It has nothing to do with time. But these units are called minutes of arc. So if I want to um, you know, get an even finer uh, measurement of angles, uh, the arc minute is uh, even smaller than the degree. In fact, each arc minute, as you might have guessed, is broken down into an even smaller unit called seconds of arc. Now, parallax shifts of stars are so small that they're less than one arc second. Okay, that means that if you took a degree and you took one 3,600th of that, 60 times 60 is 3,600, you still wouldn't have the amount of shift that happens with a star. But using telescopes, you can greatly magnify the image and therefore you can um, really increase the shift that takes place over six months. So to uh, do these calculations, we say the distance in parsec is equal to one over the parsec angle in arc seconds. Okay? So basically, if a star shifts by one arc second, its distance is one parsec. If the star shifts by a half an arc second, one over one half is two. The distance is two parsecs. If it's a tenth of an arc second, ten parsecs, so on and so forth. So the greater the shift um, that takes place, the closer the star. All right. Now, again, atmospheric uh, blurring would make it very difficult to, to measure distances accurately for, the, for the, the furthest stars. However, a satellite, which was a joint project between uh, the European Space Agent, uh, ESA, and NASA, um, built a, uh, a very accurate space probe, which would use uh, telescopes above the Earth's atmosphere, so there's no atmospheric blurring, and it could really very precisely measure any shift in position. Um, this greatly improved the accuracy of stellar pa parallax. 
And thanks to Hipparchus, we can tell stellar distances out to a, a very, very uh, great distance. Um, the Hipparchus mission uh, was fairly accurate all the way out uh, to about 1,000 light years, which is good because that's a pretty good size uh, chunk of our galaxy. And uh, again, distance is very important to, to know because if you don't know the distance of a star, you don't know how bright it is. After Parkos, uh, another mission called Gaia um, is uh, uh, going to be launched this year. And um, this mission will improve accuracy to 50-fold, which means um, that we're going to be able to see out to um, 5,000, I'm sorry, 50,000 light years and pretty much map almost the entire galaxy. That'll allow us to uh, you know, basically see um, the properties of a billion stars and really get a, a good statistical handle on what's going on. And again, if you take a look at um, the range that Gaia is going to be able to see and you superimpose it on the galaxy, uh, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, you really see that um, it, it's going to be able to uh, you know, tell us just about everything about every star in the galaxy. Um, those stars that are too far away, uh, like over here, are blocked by the central uh, nucleus of our galaxy anyway. So, um, you know, re really going to be a, a big advance in terms of uh, stellar uh, astrometry. So again, um, Parsec is basically 3.26 light years when we're looking at the nearest stars. Um, you know, they're a few parsecs away. Uh, here we're taking a look at all our closest stars. You know, the interesting thing here is most of these stars are red dwarfs, or tiny stars that aren't very bright. Proxima Centauri, Bernard Star, Wolf 359. Nobody's heard of these. Uh, some of these have some really strange names. All of these stars here, okay, are red dwarfs that I've, I've shown. Okay, and again, you see the different distances. The closest stars are about one and a third parsecs, and even going out through you know the top of the list, um, you're going out to about three and a half parsecs. We look at the brightest stars once again. Looking at this chart that we saw saw before, and here you can see the parallax measurements in arc seconds. Okay, notice that when the um, parallax angle is large. Let's get a big one, like Alpha Centauri is really large because it's a real close by star. There's a huge difference between the apparent magnitude, how bright it is um, in our sky, and how bright it actually is. Close stars appear to be bright because they're close. However, when the parallax angle is very, very small, Let's say, for instance, with Rigel. Rigel's a really bright star. Um, okay? What we get there, I don't know why that box just appeared, is a huge difference between the apparent and absolute magnitude, but in the other direction. Okay. Um, so parallax is a really powerful tool for measuring distances. Parallax... Uh, originally helped us see some of the very nearby stars, but now with uh, Hipparchus and its ability to measure distances, we can see out to 1,000 light years or accurately measure out to 1,000 light years. And soon with Gaia, um, we should be able to see uh, most of our own galaxy. Now, another method that used to be used is proper motion. Um, stars will actually move not only due to an apparent shift, um, caused by the Earth's own movement, but they also move because they actually are rotating around or orbiting around the center of our galaxy. Now, stars that are very close to us, we can see a lot of motion because they're close by. Stars that are very distant don't move quite as much. And this proper motion is very large for some stars. This is Barnard's star. And we can see that over time, it sort of shifts back and forth, back and forth. Well, that back-and-forth motion is the Earth's own parallax. However, 
um, this up and down type motion or this diagonal motion that you see right here is due to its actual movement around the galaxy. So again, stars with a high proper motion were known to be close to us. All right. Other methods that have been used, um, you know, just measuring uh, distances, you know, if it's within our own galaxy, I'm sorry, our own solar system, um, we can actually use radar and radio signals to determine the distances of planets. If it's out to about a thousand light years, we can use stellar parallax. Um, if we're going even further than that, we need to study the properties of stars and find similar stars in order to get even larger distances. Here's the reasoning, okay? Forgive me, it's a little bit convoluted. The whole idea of Hipparchus is to you know, produce this huge catalog of different stellar distances, okay? And if you can study the spectra of all these stars and match them to distance and brightness, you can find even more distant stars than what Hipparchus has studied. And if it has a similar spectra to something you find in the Hipparchus catalog, you can say, okay, well, I can't measure that distance, but it has the same fingerprint, remember, Stellar spectras are sort of a fingerprint. It has the same fingerprint as this other star that's closer by, so I know these stars are nearly identical. If they're nearly identical, they have the same brightness. And we call this process spectroscopic parallax. Okay? There's no parallax that takes place, but it allows us to match known stars to even more distant stars and determine how far away they are. Okay? Because the known stars, we know their distance, we know how intrinsically bright they are. We, we have their absolute magnitudes already. But, um, you know, these unknown stars that we can match, since we know how bright they uh, should be, we can determine their distance. Um, <clears throat> spectroscopic parallax is, uh, you know, not used as much uh, and probably won't be used as much when, when Gaia becomes active. But it, um, it still does help us with more difficult distances. Here's an interesting method of determining distances. Um, it was discovered that pulsating stars, stars that periodically uh, get brighter and dimmer, um, would actually uh, pulse uh, proportional to their actual size. Okay, here's the thinking here. Let's say you've got this really distant star, and it's pulsing. You can determine the distance of that star if you know the apparent brightness, how bright it is in our sky, and you know how big the surface is. Okay? The bigger the star, the brighter it is. The smaller the star, the less bright it is. You can use temperature, size, and that can help you determine absolute brightness. Now, with these pulsating stars, because they pulse at the same rate, or I should say, because they pulse at a rate relative to the side, the small stars pulse faster, the big stars take a longer time to pulse, um, they're a good way of determining distance. Now, here's how they work. Some of these variable stars uh, expand, cool off, their temperature lowers, so they give off much less light. It's kind of strange, because they're getting bigger but they're getting, giving off less light because they're getting cooler. As they contract, they heat up, becoming brighter, and then they go through the same cycle again. Bright, uh, dark, bright, dark. Uh, cool, hot, cool, hot. And here is a plot showing the absolute magnitude, how bright they are, compared to the period of pulsation. Great fit here. Absolutely, you know, fantastic fit. Um, you know, very little scatter along that line. So with these stars, all you have to do is this. You look up and you find out exactly what its um, period is in days. Let's say its period, in this case, because it's a logarithmic scale, is 20 days. Okay? So I'm going to draw a little line indicating a period of 20 days. 
Well, I can then match that with the absolute magnitude that it should have. Okay? Well, the two lines would intersect. I didn't do a good job of this. I'm a little bit hot. Higher than the line should be. But it looks like that tells me that I have an absolute magnitude of negative 5. So I didn't even have to do a parallax measurement here. I looked at the pulsation period, and I got an absolute magnitude. Now I know something about the star I didn't. It's very good for um, not only measuring the distance of the pulsating star, but because very distant stars are often grouped in clusters, you can look at a far cluster, like a globular cluster that we'll talk about later on. And you can see if you see any pulsating stars, use its pulsating stars and say, aha, this star pulses so many days, it's this bright, it appears to be this bright in my telescope, therefore this whole cluster must be this far away. So you can tell the distance of not only the pulsating star, but every star that's in its close proximity. Okay? We call this a standard candle. It has uh, sort of a calibrated relationship between um, one of its properties and its brightness. For even greater distances, some of the greatest distances that have ever been measured, have used something called a Type 1A supernova. The way a Type 1A supernova works is we have a binary star, two stars together. One star is a giant. It dumps material onto a small star known as a white dwarf. So here's a giant gravitational um, pull from the white dwarf, pulls gas in, and accumulates on the, the uh, white dwarf. Now this white dwarf goes through little explosions we call nova. So it gets brighter every once in a while. Nova means new star. Um, but the, the white dwarf can't be any heavier than um, about 1.4 times the mass of the Earth. Sorry, 1.4 times the mass of the Sun. If it exceeds that mass, that star will blow up. It'll destroy itself, just blow itself out of existence. But the cool thing is, because whenever it reaches its 1.4 mass limit, okay, it blows up, the explosions are always the same. They're always equally bright. So if we know how bright the explosion is, and we look at these supernova, and we see how bright it actually appears to be, we can use the difference between absolute magnitude that we know and apparent magnitude that we can measure and determine the distance. Type 1a supernova are very, very important for determining the distances of faraway galaxies. So again, um, in terms of you know, talking about the different uh, ways that we measure distance, and distance is so important, we use stellar parallax for um, objects that are very close by. Okay? Right now, we're good out to about 1,000 light years. Very soon, we'll be good out to about 50,000 light years. Now, proper motion was used in the past. We don't really use that very much anymore. Spectroscopic parallax, um, we use uh, basically the, um, the spectra of the stars to determine how bright they should be. And these pulsating stars give us distances up to maybe 20 million light years away. And the type 1a supernovas allow us to see all the way to the edge of our universe. So um, the beautiful thing is we have a method to measure just about any distance for any object. It doesn't mean that it's easy. Sometimes extracting out distances can be very challenging. But with all these tools, um, astronomy is really taking uh, quite a few leaps and bounds, uh, you know, being able to measure anything at any distance just about. Okay, let's talk about the spectral classification of stars. So we got over measuring how bright something is. And um, earlier, in earlier chapters, we talked about taking the spectra of stars, you know, analyzing the light. Um, now we're going to talk about using that spectra and, you know, determining uh, other things like temperature and chemical composition. 
So most of the light of the star, as we know, comes from the star's photosphere. We saw that with our uh, discussion of the sun. Now, the spectra of the star re reveals, again, how hot it is and what some of the, the elements might be present in the star. Um, hot, dense bodies uh, basically give off a continuous spectrum, what we call a black body spectrum, and this black body spectrum reflects the temperature. If it's cool, like around 1,500 degrees, Kelvin would be cool, be like a brown dwarf, cool by stellar standards, gives off mostly infrared light. Um, a red dwarf, is about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. It gives off mostly red and infrared light. Our sun at 5,500 degrees gives off a peak intensity in the uh, yellow part of the spectrum. Sirius at 7,000 degrees peaks further in the, the green, so it gives off all colors of light. And finally, like Rigel's about 10,000. So the color of the star is actually determined by the temperature. In addition to this continuous spectrum, where we look at all the colors on a large scale and determine temperature from that, there's also the outer part of the atmosphere, which is slightly cooler and therefore absorbs some of the light from below. Remember the sun's photosphere? Since the photosphere is primarily responsible for providing the light, we know that when we look into the sun, we're actually looking about 1,000 kilometers inward. Okay, the top of the sun is about 4,400 degrees Kelvin, slightly cooler than the bottom of the photosphere that we can see, which is 6,600 degrees Kelvin. So those outer layers absorb some of the light from underneath, leaving these dark absorption lines. Okay, in most stars, um, the spectral lines uh, can tell you what chemicals are present. Some unusual stars do actually have um, such hot atmospheres that uh, they exhibit some emission lines, but that's very, very unusual. So, for instance, the chemical composition of the sun. The sun is um, about, you know, about two-thirds hydrogen by mass, about one-third helium by mass, and then a lot of other elements that are there. Just because an element is present, in the atmosphere of a star doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to produce an absorption line. Um, basically, here's a chart showing where these absorption lines show up and where they disappear. The reason for this is, as these gases heat up, the absorption lines represent transitions between different energy states. If the energy state's very high, it's only going to appear at a high temperature. If the energy state is lower, then a lower temperature. So we can see here, Calcium lines are very common in stars like our own sun. Uh, so are some of the iron lines. The hydrogen lines seem to appear in stars, you know, usually slightly hotter than our sun. And helium lines appear in the hottest uh, stars. So um, just because spectral lines might not be present doesn't necessarily mean that these elements might not be present. They appear and disappear depending on different temperature. Now, the first attempt to classify stars according to their spectra was done at a time where astronomers basically didn't have a clue what the spectra meant. Okay? Initially, a scale was developed called the Harvard class scale, which was based on the line strength of, of hydrogen. Now, going back, let's go back one. Here's the hydrogen line right here. For low for cooler stars, the lines are weak. For stars around the temperature of, um, say, like Sirius, uh, the lines uh, get uh, much more intense. And then as the stars get hotter and hotter, the lines go away. Well, the problem was, because they didn't know what these um, spectral lines, that, the, that these spectral lines depended on the temperature, they said, well, an A star has the strongest line, a B star has the next strongest, and a C, so on and so forth. You see the problem here. The problem here is that that means that your A star would peak at 10,000 degrees Kelvin. That's fine. But cooler or hotter than that 
would be considered a B star. Cool, even cooler or hotter than that would be a C star and so on. So once he realized that there were even uh, more complicated features uh, to the spectra other than the hydrogen line, um, they had to go back and recalibrate the system, and it got all screwed up. <laughs> so what do we have today? Well, we have basically these different letters that really don't have a lot of meaning anymore assigned to different temperature stars. Um, the way I always was taught to remember this uh, was a mnemonic. I didn't make this up. But um, from hottest to coolest, it goes O-B-A-F-G-K-M. And my astronomy teacher taught me O B A fine girl or guy, don't want to be sexist here, and kiss me. All right. I don't say that in class anymore because I'm always afraid somebody's going to accuse me of uh, being fresh. But that is the old mnemonic that was always used uh, to remember this. And again, it goes from hottest to coolest here. You don't want to use that. Don't, don't worry about that. But the O star is always the hottest. O stars are incredibly hot. They're incredibly rare. And um, they burn their hydrogen so quickly that they don't last very long. Okay? Next after that is the B star. Um, the B star, like the O star, is uh, a bluish, bluish white star. A is white. F is uh, yellow white. G is yellow. K is orange. And then M is red. So with these spectral classes, and I've matched the uh, color to the spectral class, uh, the color of the star really determines, or I should say the temperature of the star, really determines what the color is. Again, hotter is bluer, redder is, um, redder means that, you know, hotter, hot, I'm sorry, hotter is bluer, cooler is redder. Okay. Let's look at some examples of uh, stars. Um, here's some actual spe stellar spectra, and you can see um, here that the hydrogen alpha line, a little bit hard to see, um, is quite strong in the A-class star. Okay, Hydrogen beta line is really easy to see. It really peaks right around there. Now, in addition to letters, we do use numbers you know, it's sort of a finer uh, grading system. Um, and um, it goes from zero to nine. Zero being hotter, uh, nine being cooler. So the hottest known stars are O5 stars. Then slightly cooler is O6, then O7, O8, O9. Then it goes to B, B0, B1, B2, B3, et cetera, et cetera. Then after that, it goes to A stars and F stars and G stars. We're a G2 star. Our sun is a G2. Um, so again, these letters and numbers, the letters are the, the main divisions in the spectral class. The numbers represent finer divisions. It's basically telling you how hot the star is. O class star. Um, Hetsaya in... Uh, Orion is an example of this. This star is actually the bottom star in the sword of Orion. And although it's uh, 1,300 light years away from Earth, it's still a magnitude 2.8 star. Um, it's 12,600 times brighter than our own sun because it's just so hot. Other examples of spectral classes. Uh, the B-class star. Rigel is a great example of a B-class star. Um, it's a B81A star. The B8 means that it's kind of on the cool side for a B star, but 66,000 times brighter than our sun because not only is it big, 71 times its diameter, it's very hot. Sirius, um, brightest star in the, sky, in the sky after the sun, is a nice example of an A-class star. Uh, Alpha Carinae, known as Canopus, not visible from our latitude, unfortunately. A nice example of an F-class star, sort of a yellow-white star. Uh, slightly hotter than our sun, not quite as hot as the white star Sirius. 
Of course, our sun is a great example of a G-class star, but also our, one of our closest neighbors, Alpha Centauri, also known as Rigel Centaurus. Both our sun and the larger of the Alpha Centauri stars are G2 stars. K-class stars include the smaller companion of Alpha Centauri, Alpha Centauri B. And finally, M-class stars uh, would be like Proxima Centauri, the smallest of the stars in the uh, Centauri system. Okay, so what have we done so far? We've talked about the brightness of stars, the absolute magnitude, and we've talked about how the spectra helps us determine the temperature of the star. Once we have those two things, we can put it all together, and that's what Hertzsprung and Russell did. They graphed the brightness of the stars as a function of the, sp the spectra of the star. And when this was done, um, some interesting patterns showed up. So the HR diagram is really important for, for uh, astronomy. Here's the graph. Again, on the left-hand side of the graph, we have absolute magnitude. How bright is a star? On the bottom, we have temperature. How hot is a star? And the unfortunate thing is the hot end is here and the cold end is here. So it's sort of backwards. Well, the first thing that they noticed when they graphed this is in the graph, this grouping of stars appeared along this curve right here. Okay? In fact, um, most of the stars, almost all the stars, would be along that group. We call this the main sequence because that's mainly where we found the stars. We now know today that those are relatively young to middle-aged stars and that most stars spend their life there. They also noticed a grouping of stars up here. We call them giants. And later on, it was eventually determined that there is an even uh, brighter group of stars, which was even more rare, called the supergiants. So again, when we look at most of the stars, most of the stars are normal-sized stars. On the HR diagram, the cooler stars, like the red dwarves, are down here. Um, K-class stars like Alpha Centauri B are right here. Here's our sun. Here's um, a star such as like uh, Canopus. Here's where Sirius is. Here's where, uh, well, Rigel would be up in the, the supergiants. But here are the B-class stars, and finally the O's over here. Notice, once again, as we go hotter, we go further up the scale, showing... Uh, a brighter and brighter star. And again, um, this is very interesting because the lifetime of a star depends on how hot it is. Like uh, Alpha Centauri uh, B, or actually uh, 81 Cygni A, um, will be around for about 100 billion years. Our sun is only going to be around for about uh, 10 billion years total. Um, stars like Sirius only last for a billion years. Stars like uh, Archinar only last for a tenth of a million years. Um, I'm sorry, a tenth of a billion years, about a hundred million years. And um, something that has nothing to do with Alpha Centauri, a star called Beta Centauri, will only live for about 10 million years. So you can see, again, if you're real hot in terms of temperature, you're going to burn out quickly. The really cool stars last for a very long time. Okay, so that's spectral class. Um, it tells you basically uh, the temperature of the star. Now, luminosity class is related to how bright the star is, but also to how big it is. With the luminosity class, um, stars like our own sun are down here at Roman numeral 5. Sometimes you get a slightly dim star. We call that a subdwarf, Roman numeral 6. But um, all, most of the stars in our galaxy are main sequence or subdwarfs. Okay? As the stars get bigger and they deviate from the main sequence, they're classified as subgiants as being a little bit off the, off the 
main line. Giants, Roman numeral two and three, or the brightest stars known as supergiants. Even the classification for supergiant, which is Roman numeral one, is in even smaller subclasses. 1B are the lesser of the supergiants. 1A are the brighter of the supergiants. And sometimes we even include a special subclass called 1A0. These stars are so bright, they're not only called supergiants, they're called hypergiants. Now, the name's misleading. Giant, whether a star is a giant, a uh, supergiant, or a hypergiant, is somewhat related to size, but it's actually more related to how bright the star is. So when we see a, different st a certain star and its, its uh, spectral class is given, you'll see a letter, like G, means that it's a yellow star. A number, 2, means that it's sort of a hot G-class star. And then you'll see a Roman numeral. Our sun is G25, meaning that it's a yellow star, it's on the main sequence with that Roman numeral 5. Okay? And that's where these different Roman numerals would look like superimposed on the HR diagram. All right. And again, here's another view of um, the HR diagram. This time it, it's plotting real stars. And a lot of these stars were from Hipparchus. And you can clearly see, here's the main sequence, this big line down here. Here are the giant stars, and there are a few stars up here, the supergiants. So, again, those are very rare. These are actually dead stars down here. They're white dwarfs that we'll talk about later on. So, again, main sequence stars. Um, M class is the smallest. O is the largest. Mass is the primary, primary determining factor. If the star is low in mass, it's down here. It's medium, it's here. It's high in mass, it's up here. Now, again, look at this. The O-class star is 40 times as massive as our sun. It's almost a half a million times brighter than our sun with a very high surface temperature. Our sun has a standardized mass of one solar uh, mass. I mean, it's standardized on itself. It's calibrated on itself. The temperature is almost 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And then we go down here, red dwarf, the M5 red dwarf, is only one-fifth the mass of our sun, okay, and only 3,000 degrees. An M8 star is about a tenth the mass of our sun. And again, here are different, solar, here are different masses of stars in their position in the HR diagram. These next charts are just interesting to compare and contrast. Here's what an M-class star would look like next to our sun and a star like Canopus. Here's an even larger collection of stars. Now the red dwarf is really dwarfed. There's our sun. Here's a B-class star and an O-class star, which are on the main sequence. And even closer up than that. Now again, um, subgiant stars are just slightly bigger than main sequence stars. Subgiant stars tend to be of any spectral class, and they're usually in transition. They're usually going from the main sequence. Um, they're at the end of their life, really. And they're either evolving into a giant star or they're evolving into a supergiant star. Good examples of subgiant uh, would include uh, Beta Carina, okay, it's one of the brightest stars in the sky. Unfortunately, we can't see it because it's in the southern hemisphere. It's an A2, which means it's a white star. Okay. Roman numeral 4, which means it's subgiant. Now, after the subgiants, we have the giants. Take a look at this. Here's our sun. Okay. Small speck. Here's what the largest main sequence star would look like. Compare that to an M giant, and you can see clearly the giant stars can get quite large. Now, just to warn you, the red giants of the giant star branches, these are um, the largest of the giants. The blue giants are, are smaller. But generally, the giants um, go anywhere from G class to M class, and they're up over here. 
again, here's our red, our red dwarf, here's our sun, here's what a blue-white supergiant might look like, and actually a red giant is bigger than some of the hotter uh, supergiants. So you've got to be careful when it says giant and supergiant. Not all supergiants are bigger than giant stars. Supergiants are always brighter. It's more about brightness. Arcturus is a good eye example of a K13, an orange giant star. Mira is a good example of an M7 star or a red giant star. Now, supergiants, again, aren't necessarily the biggest stars. Okay? They're the brightest stars. Supergiants are Roman numeral 1. 1B for the dimmest, 1A for brighter, and 1A0 for the what we call the hypergiants. Um, Supergiant stars, we don't even see many stars up there. But because they're so incredibly bright, okay, the few that are there can be seen from a long distance. These include, here's an example of an M supergiant, okay, next to an M giant, and then finally next to the largest of the main sequence stars. So, famous uh, supergiants include uh, Betelgeuse, which is a red supergiant in the constellation Orion. Polaris, the North Star, is actually a white supergiant. Um, Polaris is the North Star, but uh, it actually has a very large uh, star in it. Um, that uh, even though it's, it's large distance uh, from Earth, I think it's a, about a thousand light years from Earth, um, it's extremely bright. Deneb is an example of a very bright um, blue-white supergiant. In fact, on some scales, it's so bright, they consider it to be a hypergiant. And Rigel is an example of a blue supergiant. Now, again, this term hypergiant isn't always accepted by everyone. The term hypergiant um, really is used as a superlative. It's supposed to be the brightest of the brightest. It's the most bright supergiants. And some examples of this include Eta Carinae. Okay, this is a star that's 100 times to 200 times more massive than our own sun. Um, in fact, the brightest star known is a blue hypergiant. Um, it's called R136A1. And it's not even in our own galaxy. It's in the, uh, the large Magellanic uh, cloud. And um, it's at the center of this really massive cluster. Uh, Rho Cassiopeia is an example of a massive yellow hypergiant. Here's what the sun would look like next to Rho Cassiopeia. Really unbelievable, some of the sizes. And the largest known uh, star that we, we've ever studied is uh, called VY Canis Majoris. It's 2,000 times the diameter of the sun. If we put it in our own solar system, it would expand beyond the orbit of Saturn. So those are the most extreme stars. Um, in terms of, on the other hand, side of the scale, we want to talk about very small stars. Um, these really aren't stars at all, so I've got to be careful when I, I make this designation. Uh, we can go to what are known as white dwarfs. White dwarfs are not actually stars because we don't have nuclear fusion taking place at their cores. And one of the definitions that, that I like for a star is that it's actively fusing lighter elements into heavier elements in its core. Now, our sun's going to become one of these white dwarfs in about 5 billion years. But uh, essentially, um, these are nothing more than the, the dead embers, the, you know, the dead uh, remains of what was once a star, much like our own sun. And just to give you an example of what a white dwarf looks like next to the sun, um, a white dwarf is about the size of our Earth. So when we're comparing you know, the size of our sun to the size of a white dwarf, that's what it would look like. And a good example of one of these is uh, 
Sirius B. The companion star to uh, Sirius A, which is the uh, white star we talked about earlier. Um, white dwarfs are so incredibly small compared to normal stars. Again, they're about the size of the Earth. That even though they can be very hot, they don't give off very much light. Now, Sirius B was once about four to five times as massive as the sun, but it gave off most of its mass as it died out, and now um, it's about the mass of our, our own sun, but it's about the size of the Earth. So let's compare size of stars. Again, the size or the radius of the star really depends on many different things. First of all, more massive stars tend to be bigger. But the other thing we have to recognize is that stars can get quite large toward the end of their lives. As they age and they begin to uh, die, the stars will actually uh, bloat out. They'll, they'll get bigger because the cores become unstable. They actually push the outer layers. So in terms of overall size, the white dwarf is the smallest, about the size of the Earth. The red dwarf would be next, about one-tenth of the size of the sun at the very smallest. Our own sun um, is the standard for solar radii. A giant star, hmm, approximately 10 times the radius of our sun, but it can really vary. The red giants are going to be larger. The yellow giants are going to tend to be smaller. The smaller supergiants, uh, about 100 times the radius of our, our sun, and the largest of the stars, uh, 1,000 times the radius of our sun, where VY Canis Majoris is 2,000 times the radius. And again, we can look at the different stellar radii and where they lie on the HR diagram. White dwarfs are right down here um, along this radius of 1 100th the radius of our sun. Here's one-tenth. So a red dwarf would be right about there. There's where our sun is. There are the giant stars. Um, there are the, the hundred times the radius, and then a thousand times the radius would be up here where the red soup hypergiants are. By the way, the size of the star does affect the star's density, and therefore will affect the spectra. There's something called pressure broadening. When a star is very dense, the photosphere is under a lot of pressure. This actually causes the spectral lines to um, wash out or expand. For instance, with a white dwarf, if I take the same spectra, which I would see at the same temperature, the lines on a white dwarf are very diffuse. They're spread out. And the reason for this is you've taken something about the mass of the sun, and now it's about the size of the earth, all that gas is under a tremendous amount of pressure at that density. So therefore, we look at the spectral lines of a white dwarf. Even if we don't know how big that star is, we can see the high density means that it's small. Main sequence stars have wider spectral lines, but the largest stars actually have the thinnest spectral lines because they're under the lowest pressure. There's the least amount of spectral broadening there. And here's another HR diagram. It uh, shows the frequency of different spectral luminosities in, in the classes. Um, not all that, that different from what we see, saw before, but again, um, you know, you note that there are a ton of main sequence stars, you know, quite a few giant stars, a few white dwarf stars, but very few supergiants. By the way, Stars do come in uh, groups of two or more. In fact, it's thought that over about half of all the stars in our galaxy are binary or multiple stars. Now, when two stars orbit each other, the masses of, uh, are typically similar within about a factor of 10. Um, and again, more than a third to about half the stars are at least binary, meaning two, or multiple star systems. Now, here's a good thing about this. Binary and multiple stars are very, very important because they can help us determine the mass of a star. 
We can't directly measure the mass of a star, uh, basically because of their very large sizes and, and distances. But we can indirectly measure them by watching the stellar orbits. Just as the orbit of a planet or a moon can be used to find the mass of um, the object that or orbits, a star orbiting a star tells you a lot about the mass of the star. For instance, compare two stars. The size and period of the orbit will tell you the mass. The higher mass star has a smaller orbit. The lower mass star has a bigger orbit. If you measure the size of these orbits, and it's possible to do that even with spectra, and how <clears throat> fast the period is, you can get mass. The lower the period, the shorter the time it takes them to orbit, the more massive the stars are. Now, binary stars come into many different categories. Sometimes the two stars that are orbiting each other are far enough apart where you can actually separate them with a telescope. You can actually see them as two separate stars in a telescope. Sometimes the stars are so close together you can't see anything but one star. The image basically of the two stars merge because you don't have that resolution. But you can tell that they're two different stars because you can see them two distinct st stellar spectra that actually change over time, usually due to Doppler effects. Finally, in rare cases where the orbits are aligned with the, our sight, one star will pass in front of the other, and we call these eclipsing binaries. Again, um, just in summary, we covered a lot of different things today. Uh, so this is quite a long presentation. But, um, you know, just in summary, you know, uh, measuring the distance to stars, measuring the brightness of stars, and measuring the mass of stars is very important. Um, if I take a survey of all the stars in our, in our galaxy, uh, red dwarfs have the lowest mass of all, but they're also the most common. Um, the most massive stars are blue main sequence uh, stars. And um, giant stars tend to be medium mass stars, even though their size is large. Um, the most massive stars become supergiants. They're basically old blue stars that um, are reaching the end of their lives. And <clears throat> we believe that no star can get really bigger than about 100 to 150 times the mass of the sun. Again, masses of stars, we're able to measure them because binary stars have allowed us to characterize them, okay? In our galaxy, probably about 65% of all the stars are these boring, tiny red dwarf stars. About 22% of all the stars are dead white dwarf stars. Our sun's actually a little bit unusual because our sun um, is not a red dwarf or it's not a white dwarf. And... The stars that make up this remaining classes of stars are only about 13% of the total stars in, in, the, uh, in the galaxy. O stars, very, very uh, rare. Um, I have to even count the number of zeros here, but about 36 of a millionth of a percent um, of all stars are O stars. Giant stars are about a millionth of a percent and supergiant stars make up less than a trillionth of a percent of all the stars that are out there. Very, very rare. So again, in summary, um, distance to stars is measured in light years or parsecs. We do that through a, diff a variety of different measurements. And uh, Hipparchus has really um, greatly improved our ability to do this. Spectral classes is usually related to the temperature of the star. We can tell the temperature very easily simply by looking at the light that the star gives off. Luminosity class, we use Roman numerals for this, is related to the brightness of the star. Um, I know they use terms like giant and supergiant. Really, they're talking more about the brightness of the star when they're talking about you know, supergiant or giant star. Even though these stars are physically large, it's more about the brightness. Um, Sizes of stars, anywhere from about a tenth of the diameter of the, this, the sun. Okay, it's not including white dwarfs that are a hundredth. Up to about a thousand times the radius of the sun. Think about this. 
If something is a thousand times the radius of the sun, that's only its linear diameter. Its volume, how much space it takes up, is actually a thousand times a thousand times a thousand. Vy canis majoris is actually a billion times the volume of the sun. And finally, binary stars are very important for determining the masses of stars. Okay, sorry for the long lecture, but uh, you know, hopefully this gives you a nice overview of the different uh, properties of stars.